Good morning, and thanks for joining us today for the 2022 State of the District and Region Conference. I'm Carolyn Rudd, Chair of the DC Chamber Board of Directors and President of CRP Incorporated. First of all, I wanna thank our sponsors. Our sponsors today include Exelon, Dempad, Bank of America, Care First, and the DC Health Link. I also want to thank each of you for joining us today. Today, you will hear from prominent business leaders, health directors, educational administrators, workforce development leaders, and our local and regional elected officials. We hope that you will engage, learn, and connect with the speakers, panelists, and invited guests. Following two years of the pandemic, we now know that the effects will be long lasting. The focus of today's conference is to show how our local business community is recovering and adapting to the new normal, working with our local government, federal partners, and the DC Chamber of Commerce. Today, we will discuss trends, strategies, solutions, and policies impacting our region in the areas of health, education, workforce, and economic development. Again, I encourage you all to engage, question, and contribute to these very important topics because each of you will play a very significant role in shaping our business community's future. Today also signals the release of the Chamber's 2022 State of Business Report. This report highlights the changing labor market, the shift to remote and hybrid work models, the local increase in small business startups and entrepreneurship. The report also summarizes the interviews with small businesses exploring what was needed to recover and grow. The report clearly reveals that our local government has been ever present to partner with the DC Chamber to assist small businesses in their new normal recovery and growth. I extend on behalf of the board a special thanks to Dr. Yasin Taylor and her team at the DC Policy Center for the development of the report. At this time, it is my pleasure to again introduce and welcome Mr. Larry Dorita, the Greater Washington DC Market President of the Bank of America. Larry is a longtime resident of the District of Columbia who joined Bank of America after 25 years of public service. Larry, the floor is now yours. Happy Friday to each of you and enjoy the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carolyn. And thanks to all of you for being here today for what should be a terrific discussion across all the points that uh, Carolyn laid out that the chamber has uh, assessed through the, work, through the uh, study that's just being released today. Bank of America is very proud to be uh, connecting with the chamber and with all of you on this work. Um, and I wanna thank the chamber for the important role that the chamber plays, uh, Angela and her team in, in our city, in our region, in helping make sure exactly as Carolyn said, that the business community, which I represent uh, with on behalf of my 2,500 teammates that are in the DMV and 600 right here in Washington and other partners that we can connect with the public sector, with elected officials and make sure we're focused on all of the very issues that Caroline laid out, that Carolyn laid out that will be discussed today. I wanna commend the chamber in particular for the focus on the specific areas uh, in the panel discussions, the recovery as Carolyn talked about and we're all going through that. The health, we all saw through the pandemic that there were unique challenges, uh, particularly in underserved communities to health, access to health um, and, and access to, to quality uh, support during the pandemic. 
Workforce development and education is such an important topic for employers in this in this region and in, in uh, DC itself. And and uh, and then of course uh, the the work that the mayor and her team are leading. So the chamber has done a very good job, an inspired job, I would say, in identifying what are the issues that the business community is focused on in each of the areas that Carolyn that the chamber has outlined for today, where we'll have panel discussions with great leaders, business and pr uh, public sector leaders. Bank of America has partnerships with our clients, with other elect with elected officials and appointed officials, and and the community at large to help drive solutions in all of these areas under the rubric of we're coming out of the pandemic, the economy is where it is. We know that we've got work to do to make sure that there's equal access to opportunity for everybody. And that's what our objective is in the business community and working closely with the chamber and elected officials. So I wanna thank the chamber for the inspired leadership. I wanna thank Carolyn for that gracious introduction. And it's my pleasure now, first of all, to wish you all a terrific day in these discussions we'll hear from elected officials and other business leaders. Thank you very much for being part of this. Bank of America is very proud to be part of it. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the terrific president of the chamber, Angela Franco. Angela, thank you very much. turn it over to Chairman Phil Mendelssohn. Chairman, thank you so much for your support of the DC Chamber and for joining us this morning. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, for inviting, inviting me. me. And, and I, I want to thank everyone who's taken the time out this morning to be here. here. Uh, uh, I, was I was asked, asked to, to give, give some, some remarks, remarks about, about uh, the, the state of the district. I sort of want to begin by saying that it's never quite clear what the state of the district is, except that I, we, we seem to be coming out of the pandemic. The government's finances seem to be healthy, and that's all good because it means that uh, all of the cuts and the um, uh, just the hard times that we had a couple of years are, seem to be behind us. Today, because it's the last day of September, is the day that we get revenue estimates. I will find out this afternoon and they'll be released probably around five o'clock. The revenue estimates will tell us what, um, uh, in a sense, give us a window into what the state of the district is uh, in terms of its economy and uh, where the city has ended up, the city government has ended up uh, at year end with its finances. It's not the final assessment, but it's nearly final. Uh, I'm optimistic that the revenue estimates will show uh, some growth, continued growth in the district. Um, I think the biggest concern that I have is, and I think everybody has, is it's not clear how the downtown and office market is going to come back from the pandemic. I don't have any answers there. I think the revenue estimates will include some projections and the chief financial officer does um, does rely on some experts in terms of his expectations. We'll see that in terms of commercial property tax revenue projections or, that the chief financial officer makes over the next uh, few years. That is, that he makes today regarding the next few years. I, I want to touch on some other issues, if I may. Um, I think top of mind for a lot of folks is what's going on with the migrants that are being shipped to the district by Southern states. It's very concerning to me because I think the governors are making, trying to make a political point at the expense of these migrants. And it is placing a burden on jurisdictions like New York City and the District of Columbia, Chicago, uh, and, and, and Massachusetts. Uh, we are trying to step up to the plate. A week ago, the council, adopted uh, with some revisions, minor revisions, the mayor's proposal to establish a, an Office of Migrant Services, which would handle migrants outside of our rather robust homeless shelter system. The, um, that doesn't mean that the, the migrants won't be given services because that's absolutely the intent. Uh, but um, I say outside the system so we don't overwhelm the system. There have been about 9,000 migrants who've been bused to the district over the last several months. And uh, it started out at about 50 a day and it's now about 300 a day. 
And the last information I had was that it wasn't letting up and there was no end in sight. Uh, we have asked the federal government for assistance and FEMA has helped with some grants, uh, but it really is, um, I, I, I wanna say overwhelming, but I, maybe that's not, maybe that's overstating it. Um, it's a burden and we're trying to step up with regard to that. I've had conversations with our Attorney General Carl Racine about whether there's some legal options available to the district with regard to these southern states. Uh, and that, and I know he's working with the other cities and states to see if there's um, there's some options there. I came back from a conference with uh, large city council presidents a week ago, hosted by the National League of Cities. And what really struck me was that the struggles that we're having with regard to affordable housing and homelessness are shared by every city across the country. And so we think of it as a local issue. And to be sure, we need to do what we can locally. But this really is a national issue, both the shortage of housing as well as the uh, homelessness and the way it's playing out in different cities. And there, there were no strategies that other cities are pursuing that we're not trying here with regard to uh, both of those issues. Uh, we have about $1.6 billion in this year's budget, the budget that starts tomorrow, uh, for a range of programs that deal with affordability or homelessness. Whether we're talking about what we call tax expenditures, which are tax abatements for low-income housing providers or producers, um, or um, our housing production trust fund, which this year we're putting another $450 million into that. Um, permanent supportive housing to help people get out of homelessness. Uh, so there are a lot of different strategies that are being pursued and uh, there are none that other cities are pursuing that we're not, that aren't on our list. Um, starting tomorrow, there'll be a new department of buildings. Uh, this was the council's answer to the continuing dysfunction uh, with the Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs. Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs is being broken up into two agencies. The Department of Buildings will be housing code enforcement, uh, construction permit approval, uh, zoning regulation, not the zoning commission, but the zoning administrator, those kinds of services. Uh, what else is in the Department of Consumer Regulatory Affairs will remain, but it will be in a new Department of Licensing and Consumer Affairs. We've increased uh, in the budget for this coming year. Uh, we've increased the number of inspectors, both on the construction side, as well as housing code enforcement. And uh, we have uh, required of the city that uh, they do a lot of pre-planning, most of which has been done, not all of it. For instance, a business process assessment has not been done, even though it's supposed to be completed by today. Uh, but a lot of other preliminary work has been done. And so the challenge is gonna be to make sure that everything the new Department of Buildings needs is, is uh, all of its needs are met. Uh, that's gonna be the challenge and also to ensure that this new agency, because it's a new agency, starts off with a new business climate, if you will, so that uh, there's more of a sense to mission by the workers. Uh, that I think has been a struggle in the agency. Uh, in the end, what should happen is that for residents, there'll be less illegal construction. And when they're trying to get permits for like uh, renovating their, their, house, their, you know, their basement, that it's not such a long and arduous process. Uh, for tenants, it means that uh, there should be better enforcement of the housing code, that uh, when uh, there's a apartment building in Southeast, it doesn't have heat, that the inspectors not only come out right away, but they don't wait a month to come back to see if the heat was turned down. And for businesses, that uh, when uh, they're trying to get uh, permits for build out or per permits to build something new, that doesn't take forever. And I hope as well that there won't be uh, more and ever more uh, permit fees that are being required. Uh, we also, with the budget that starts tomorrow, uh, created some new um, funding formulas for schools, DC public schools that um, have a large number of kids in poverty. We, we technically they're called uh, 
uh, students at risk, at risk students. Uh, so there's more funding there. And we're looking at this fall trying to do more with regard to the budget formulation for schools so that there's more stability in our public schools. That would be DCPS going forward. And the last thing I want to touch on is a crime that uh, I had a conversation earlier this week with the deputy mayor for public safety who noted that even though it doesn't feel this way, the violent crime is down slightly this year compared to last year at this time. But I think there's still a lot more that needs to be done. Uh, I'm committed to uh, doing what I can to make sure that MPD has the resources it needs, uh, not only to make people feel safe, but also to be closing cases more quickly, more cases and more and cases more quickly. I think that will go a long way toward uh, reducing crime. And I have some other thoughts there as well. If Angela, you want me to take any questions, but that was my quick, um, oh, there was one other thing on my list. Many of you were concerned. The chamber I know was active with trying to get legislation revised that was adopted a couple of years ago to prohibit non-compete agreements for all businesses. And we were able to get that revised so that if I remember correctly, it applies only to businesses with, um, I think it's, uh, gosh, now I can't remember, um, it, it, businesses with employees who earn less than um, uh, three times the minimum wage. I, I didn't say that quite right. That the prohibition only applies um, with regard to employees who are earning three times the minimum wage or less. So that was, I think, a victory for the chamber. If you want, I'm happy to take questions. I see that I've been we've been joined by my colleague Kenyon McDuffie, who's a great council member and I support. Um, but uh, if you want, I'll take questions. Thank you so much, Chairman. We're gonna keep moving to the next speaker. We appreciate all your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, Chairman Mendelssohn, for your um, comments and your presentation. That was wonderful. And thank you so much for joining us and your support of the DC Chamber of Commerce. Now let's welcome Sherry Ann Kelly, President and CEO of the Association of Chambers of Commerce Executives. ACCE represents over 10,000 industry professionals and serves the chamber community across the country. In her role, Sherry Ann is responsible for leading the team which serves, which serves the community via professional development, innovative problem solving, best practices, and industry thought leadership. We are so excited to have you with us, Sherry Ann. Thank you so much for your support of the DC Chamber of Commerce and for joining us this morning. Thank, Thank you so, so much, Angela. Angela. Um, it, it is, is a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's absolutely wonderful to be around so many people who are trying to make a huge difference in Washington, D.C. and the surrounding region. Um, so it's my pleasure to get a chance right now to talk a little bit about the role of Chambers of Commerce and how the D.C. Chamber fits to that larger ecosystem. Um, one of the first things I always like to talk about is it's been challenging for the past couple of years for local businesses, but it's also been equally challenging for Chambers of Commerce. We faced the pandemic, we had economic challenges, labor shortages, supply chain issues, but also political and social unrest. You know, by any standards, these are just unprecedented disruptive times. What's been wonderful about the Chamber of Commerce industry is that we've been able to turn this disruption into opportunity. There was real opportunity to better serve our communities and to elevate our communities, even during some of the toughest times that we've faced in recent decades. So what did all of this get us, all of this um, work and challenge? We're actually in the midst of a chamber renaissance where chambers of commerce are being called on even more than in the past to be thought leaders, partners, and to weigh in on issues that historically we've never weighed in on before. And there's several factors that weigh into the fact that we've landed in this chamber of commerce renaissance. One was that during the pandemic, economic recovery focused, in fact, I'd say laser sharp focused on the biggest challenges and the biggest opportunities in our communities. 
And what we're seeing within chambers across the country is there's a shift now to relying on that laser sharp focus. So again, when we're focused exclusively on the biggest challenges and opportunities, we're much more effective. But there's been something else that's sort of shifted in chambers of commerce, which is a new model really focused on innovation. So chambers now have a very innovative and entrepreneurial mindset. They're taking new approaches to the work that they do and taking new approaches to some of the initiatives that they're taking on. So at ACCE, we've come up with three pillars that are essential for chambers of commerce to be successful. What I think you'll be excited to hear is that the DC chamber really aligns with these three pillars. The first pillar is that the chamber's mission is really all about community impact. And that community impact can take many forms. It could be economic development, education, workforce and talent, policy and advocacy, inclusive and equitable economic growth, creating a strong regional economy, not just focused exclusively on your local economy, but recognizing that we're stronger when we look at things regionally, it's about being less transactional and more transformational. Chambers are spending less time trying to get people to attend maybe you know, one more golf tournament. Chambers of Commerce are really shaping the communities around us. It's all about problem solving. Chambers are here to solve the greatest challenges that our local businesses face, but also to solve the greatest challenges that our communities face. What I love about the DC Chamber is even when you look at the policy agenda for this chamber, you can see that they're addressing so many of these big community impact issues. They're focused on expanding local business and entrepreneurial capacity. You know, they're looking to really focus on economic development, supporting the growth of local job creators, developing research that really fosters recruitment and retention of businesses, as well as employees. So your local chamber is really embracing this idea of holistic community impact. So that was sort of the first pillar that's essential for chamber success. The second is courageous leadership around that mission. And with Chambers of Commerce, what we've realized is that partnerships are even more important now than they were in the past, especially unusual partnerships. This just elevates our ability to get work done. It brings more clout to the issues that we're addressing. So finding ways to partner with other organizations within the community makes our work even better. Chambers are getting engaged in lots of issues and there's been courageous leadership in the area of DEI. We've seen this in so many different ways, whether it's programs and resources, again, efforts to try to create inclusive economic development and economic growth, um, whether it's supply chain diversity opportunities for local businesses. Again, chambers of commerce are engaging in these DEI efforts. Talent and workforce, this is another place where chambers have a lot of courageous leadership and have been able to develop incredible programs that make a huge difference. How can we make sure that we're retaining our local talent, make sure that we're attracting talent to our market, sometimes it's upscaling and reskilling local workforce, um, so again, these are places where chambers play a critical role. What I get really excited about, though, is when chambers take on issues that historically they've never really engaged in. This is where that community impact piece really plays a part. So if there's a major issue that's impacting the community, it's going to impact local businesses because local businesses need a strong community in order to be successful. So you're seeing chambers get engaged in issues like homelessness, the opioid epidemic, mental health, and the DC Chamber is no different. Um, their 2022 five-step roadmap for workplace wellness is a great example of this, where the Chamber partnered with the DC Department of Health to put together this research looking holistically at worksite wellness. What I really appreciate about this effort is that they're looking at not just physical health and health insurance benefits, but also mental health, because mental health impacts our workforce and talent pool. But they're also looking at this through a DE&I lens. They're recognizing that there are inequities in our healthcare system and that businesses need to address those. So again, your local chamber is really embracing this effort. The last pillar 
when thinking about um, the success of Chambers of Commerce is that the business model for the chamber needs to align with its mission. And again, the DC Chamber has really embraced this. They have a diversified revenue stream that they're focused on trying to, again, solve the greatest challenges in their community and finding, finding uh, financial resources to support those efforts. So those were the three pillars of success for chambers, that the community impact mission is really the focus of what the chamber does. There's courageous leadership around that mission, and then the business model aligns to the mission. Again, your local chamber is doing a great job of aligning with these three pillars. And what's great is because there is this chamber of commerce renaissance, it also have the opportunity for community renaissance. You know, things are hyper local, all across the country right now. And this gives us a chance to really affect huge change and do some exciting things here in the District of Columbia. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or my team. Uh, we would be happy to assist you or to provide additional information about the role that chambers play. Um, but it's been an absolute pleasure to connect with all of you and to have the chance um, to have this conversation. So thank you, Angela, for inviting me. And thanks to everyone who's at this event who's working so hard to make our district even stronger than it's been. Um, and now I actually have the pleasure of introducing our first moderator um, for a panel on business recovery and economic development. Mr. Alex Orfinger is the publisher and market president of the Washington Business Journal. His work really helps bring this publication to the center of conversations around economic recovery, income disparity, systemic racism, and why all of these issues are so critical to the business community. And his relationship with the Greater Washington's business community, it runs deep and it's been very long. He served as a former board member on a host of local business organizations, and he's also the former chair of the DC Chamber of Commerce. So with that, welcome, Alex. With Thank you very much, and thank you for that kind introduction. And it was really terrific to hear so much about what uh, the chambers are doing, both here in the District of Columbia and how it's aligned with the work of the chambers around the country. So thank you for that. Uh, I'm really pleased to uh, be hosting this next panel. Um, you know most of these people. We, were, we have been here together in the past, most of us, and I'm just going to do a quick um, a yeah, quick round robin and ask everybody to just quickly say who they are and what their roles are. And I'm going to start with you, John Falcecchio. Uh, great. Good morning. I'm John Falcecchio, and I have the honor of serving as the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development. Uh, thanks for having me. And our former Mayor Williams. Hey, everybody. Uh, Tony Williams. I'm a CEO, uh, Executive Director of the Federal City Council. Happy to be here. Great. Council member. Good morning, everybody. I'm Kenya McDevitt. I'm council member for Ward 5, and I chair the Council's Committee on Business and Economic Development, and I am thrilled to join you this morning. And Jack. Uh, good morning, everyone. Jack McDougall with the Greater Washington Board of Trade. Great to be here. Angela, thank you for putting this on and including me. Uh, looking forward to the conversation. And Alex, thanks for moderating. Uh, there's no doubt uh, we'll, we'll hit some really good topics. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Last but not least, Yassim. Hi, good morning. I'm Yeshim Sayan. I'm the executive director of DC Policy Center. We work with the chamber on this year's state of business report, and I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Well, I'm uh, super excited to be uh, moderating this panel. And uh, Jack, thank you for your thanks in advance, uh, but I, I'd like that thanks at the end of the panel rather than before it. Um, uh, we, have a, we have a lot to cover today. Um, I want to spend some time uh, up front and just sort of, uh, sort of a, a level set to see where we are right now. And then really turn later to, um, you know, sort of pivot to what our strategies are for uh, continuing to bring about change in the city. I want to start with you, Deputy Mayor Falcecchio. When we talked last year, uh, you talked with some urgency about getting people back to their offices. Uh, the data shows some improvement, uh, but how do you rate where we are right now and what are we doing to move those numbers forward? Yeah, thanks for the question. And I think uh, you're right to focus on the improvement. Uh, so what we want to see is that the uh, the lines on the graphs are moving in the right direction, uh, and they are. Uh, we know that uh, just this uh, month we saw uh, for the first time office uh, utilization uh, go beyond 50% uh, in the central business district. 
uh, for the first time in some time. So workers are uh, coming back. Uh, that, that's actually first time since pre-pandemic. Uh, so workers are coming back. We see it on Metro as well. Now, of course, uh, we'd like the pace to improve faster. Uh, but one of the things you'll hear me talk about today is uh, we can't do that uh, with 200,000 of our workers sitting on the sidelines. Uh, and that's the federal government workforce. Uh, we heard it uh, since we last met uh, on this uh, in this forum. Uh, we saw the president at the State of the Union uh, say that the vast majority of federal government workers are coming back. We're still waiting to see them come back. Uh, and we see it in the data, uh, and we see it um, in our uh, retailers, our restaurants, and just the downtown activity. Okay. So uh, before I jump into another question, let me just do a follow-up to that. Uh, what types of conversations are happening with the federal government at this point? Uh, Mayor Williams, perhaps you can answer that, or anyone actually could. Well, I think uh, I think more directly, uh, representing uh, the mayor, uh, John can do that, and certainly uh, Kenyon. We certainly want to correspond with them and support them and as enthusiastically and aggressively as we can uh, with the federal government uh, to get the signal out to the workforce to get back. Okay, John Kenyon, would John, would you like to answer that? Uh, sure, I could uh, tell you that we stay engaged in conversation. Uh, we kind of have been bouncing kind of around the agencies uh, and who's going to be the one to step forward. I will say that the posture thus far uh, has not been where uh, we had thought or hoped it would be in terms of uh, which direction they're going. And when I say which direction they're going, I've talked about it before in June of 2021. Mayor Bowser said, for those who work in the office, you're going to be in the office three days a week and you'll have to uh, telework option that work from home for two days a week. Uh, we don't see that kind of prescribed formula coming from the federal government. And if you leave it up to every agency to make up their own uh, policy, uh, it's not going to fulfill President Biden's uh, call for the vast majority of federal workers to come back. Yeah. Uh, Kenyon? Yeah, I, I wouldn't add much to what John said. It's just that we know that in the D.C. region, we have one of the highest percentages of workforces that with people working from home. And, and it would be great to have the federal government really uh, telegraph a little bit more about what we can expect in terms of people returning to the offices. And so uh, we know we've seen some instances where they're reducing their own footprint uh, on uh, our office buildings in downtown, which is not encouraging. And so uh, having more employees uh, really uh, in our streets, in our restaurants, in our office buildings, uh, spending money, uh, increasing our sales tax, uh, the daytime foot, tra uh, daytime foot traffic uh, would be great. And so uh, I really appreciate the mayor, John's efforts, and others who have been engaging the federal government. Uh, but we definitely would love to see uh, and have a better, clear sense of, of what we can expect in terms of return to work for our federal workforce. Uh, interesting. So, uh, Yoshima, I'm going to just turn to you a little bit. I'm curious what you see in some of the numbers. Um, we've seen in the news uh, about big migrations out of cities, generally out of coastal cities and to lower cost areas. You know, is this true or false in the District of Columbia? Um, and, and talk a little bit about this breaking of the relationship between work and where people live. Um, in our past, uh, one of the biggest uh, factors that helped the district's growth is People just wanted to move into the city, be close to their offices, be close to the amenities. With remote work, some of that relationship is breaking down. We're not just seeing folks moving out of DC to the suburbs. In fact, both, both DC and the inner counties of the region are losing population, lo losing school enrollments and things like that. What we're seeing is folks moving to lower cost, smaller metro areas. So there is some sort of a talent shift that's going on right now. And sometimes the numbers obscure it because some of the workers are here, but gone. They keep their jobs in the region or in the city, but they've gone elsewhere. We don't know yet if this is just a one-time shift and then people will come back to large cities looking for their networks, looking for the amenities, or this, this will be a longer time, uh, uh, longer term trend. To be clear, this is not unique to DC or DC region. It's something that's been happening, affecting large metro areas like um, San Francisco, New York, and all other places. But there are things that are unique to DC that can help reverse that trend, that this is an amenity-rich city. This is a city where still people want to live. 
and attracting residents is going to be the most important strategy so people can come here, live here, work here, pay taxes here. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, Mike, could just say, I think three things that are going to be interesting are one, more and more research done on the home. If you live in a condo and you're sitting around at home all the time versus if you live on an estate, there are going to be different family dynamics. We haven't seen that totally play out. I mean, why did people originally leave the farms? Because they got sick of sitting around the same place all the time. Two, the labor market is, uh, if federal monetary policy starts putting a damper on the labor market and you change this relationship between labor and the employer, where labor is not totally calling the shots, employers are going to be able to demand more and more that that uh, employees be there on the work site. And I think lastly, there are going to be studies of companies. companies. There are companies already that have most of their workforce in place. Are they performing better than companies where everybody's working remotely? We'll see. Yeah. I'm curious about the financial impact, though. Um, Yashim, um, Mayor Williams, um, this is really to both of you and, and anyone else, really. But you know, this, this hypothetical law firm partner who's still working out of their D.C. office, but is residing in Florida and paying his personal his or her uh, personal personal income taxes in Florida. What impact is that going to have on the city's finances, if any? May Don't I? You worry about that, Tony. May I start? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um. So so far, we've actually not seen we've lost taxpayers, but we haven't seen a big decline in our income tax revenue. Partly because it's been driven by the very strong performance of the stock market. I think the CFO is going to release their uh, revenue estimates today or Monday, and I expect to see a downtown uh, down, down uh, world revision in the income taxes. Um, the, one of the strengths of the district is we have a very broad tax base. No other state has such a large, you know, wide number of things that they tax. We have commercial property taxes, real, you know, residential property taxes, income taxes, sales taxes, and all of that stuff. What we have seen with the pandemic is obviously sales taxes took a hit, commercial property value took a hit, so we're increasingly dependent on income taxes, which tends to be very volatile. So it's not just the level effect, but also a volatility thing that to me is troublesome. Right, so so Mayor Williams, if I may turn that to you, um, uh, not to be a sky is falling type of guy, uh, but there is, uh, is there some, fine a worry about the financial health of the city. Um, you've been to this rodeo before in the 1990s. Is this deja vu all over again? Or, you know, is there something different? What would And what would you really suggest as a, uh, to looking forward that the administration and the city council could do? I think that's a very simple question. Well, I think one thing that I think the, you heard from the council chair, I think he's cognizant of the realities and some of the problems and risks ahead. And I, I know we're going to hear from Councilman McDuffie. The mayor is launching economic development strategy. She's uh, really, through John, invited a broad range of stakeholders to be part of that strategy. I think recognizing that there has to be some, some rethinking uh, in uh, the future of our downtown. Because no matter how aggressive and successful the effort uh, is with the federal government on repopulating our workforce, there's going to be a delta between pre-COVID and uh, reality now. And I worry personally, you know, what we heard about income tax, I think, uh, you know, the nice thing about property tax is it's stable, but it's a lagging indicator. And I think the problems we're seeing with commercial uh, economy right now, absorption, all that, vacancies. We're going to show up in a couple of years. We're going to have budget problems. And I hate to be the, you know, pull away the punch bowl. And I'm no longer in office, so it's easy for me to talk a good game. But, you know, we just have to be in. And I think Kenyon is very, very good about this. And I support him strongly, political alerts, support him strongly in his race for council. We just, you know, we got into problems in the 90 by over promising and under delivering. We promised everything to everybody, and we ended up being unable to do anything for anybody. And I know the council chair uh, Mendelssohn and the mayor, and I know Kenyon want to keep us from there. And that keeps me uh, confident, but we have to be careful. All right, Kenyon, do you want to add to add, amplify any of that? Yeah, I, I would, Alex, and thank you for that, uh, Mel Williams. Uh, I think historical context is important today, uh, probably now more than ever. Uh, I think we got to be mindful of where we were in the late 80s, early 90s, when we were teetering on the brink of insolvency. 
uh, and recognize, you know, what that economic strategy the mayor is going to be putting together, uh, how important it's going to be. Because it was an economic strategy, an economic vision of Mayor Williams back in 2003 that really provided that solid foundation that we've been building on pre-pandemic over the last two decades. Uh, we got to recognize we had a, about a 33% increase in our population uh, in the late 90s up until about two 2019. We had a uh, I think our businesses grew by 23%. Our, our, our private sector job growth grew by about 45% over that same time period. Um, you know, there was more confidence in our schools uh, over the last uh, couple of decades. And so all those things made us the place to be where people wanted to come live, work, and raise their families. Um, and coming out of the pandemic, we have to acknowledge um, the challenges that we faced uh, and, and be supportive of the mayor and, and folks who recognize that uh, we, in some cases, when we are layering on new laws and, and regulations, we are making ourselves less competitive with the region. Uh, and we see that in the out migration that we've had over the last couple of years where we've lost 20,000 people uh, last year. And some of those folks are going home to the cities where they, they, they were from and they're working remotely, but then other, others are going right across the line to Bethesda because they feel safer there. Uh, or they're going over across the river to Loudoun County or Fairfax County uh, to, to open up their small business um, because of, you know, some of the laws that we have here in the District of Columbia. And so we lost lots of businesses over the course of the pandemic, which means we lost lots of jobs uh, over that same time period. And business owners are telling me that they found it difficult, increasingly difficult to do business in D.C. because of the burdensome uh, D.C. laws and regulations, and while other jurisdictions uh, in the region make it easier for people to do business. And we have to uh, make sure that we are acknowledging that when we're thinking about how we work ourselves out of this, uh, I think, pandemic and, and onto an equitable recovery. So I'm excited about the work that the mayor uh, is talking about with folks in the business community, recognizing that we're going to do more uh, to, to attract businesses, keep businesses that are here, uh, give them what they need to grow and hire more workers. And we can do that while at the same time protecting consumers and, and our workers. Well, Kenya, thank you. And, and I'm gonna do a follow-up to you and to, uh, to John on that. Uh, in this morning's business journal, Angela Franco is quoted and says, um, uh, DC should be cutting regulatory burdens and simplifying its business scene because many of these high paying businesses could easily move if forced to do so. So what exactly should this, the council's and the administration's response be to that? What What are you recommending? Can you first, maybe I'll, I'll turn to John next. I think we have to recommend that that everybody who's an elected leader have a lesson in history about the District of Columbia and, and where we were a couple of decades ago. Uh, because I think a lot of folks look at, you know, all the consecutive balanced budgets we've had, surplus after surplus, uh, and we think it's okay to raise taxes in an environment where we have over half a billion dollars in surplus funds and, uh, you know, $3 billion in federal aid. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we don't think there are going to be any consequences uh, by not giving people uh, anything in return for raising their taxes. And I say that as somebody who comes from a, a working class household uh, and, and was a dues paying member of the, the Postal Union. Uh, before I got into politics. And so, uh, but I think it's important that folks understand our history here in the city uh, mm -hmm. as we think about where we want to be five, 10, 20 years from now, um, because there is a lagging effect of some of the policies that we're putting in place. We may not realize, you know, uh, the, the consequence of it immediately, uh, but I think we should take note of the folks who have left the city, those young professionals working uh, who decided they don't have to be here in order to work here. And, thank you. and and yeah, so thank you, uh, uh, John. Um, in terms of regulatory bur burdens, simplifying the the business environment for businesses. Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's uh, and even broader than the regulatory environment. I think there are two exercises underway right now uh, that are really important, uh, and it goes like that old song: uh, one for the money, two for the show. Uh, one for the money, uh, being the Tax Revision Commission, uh, which is underway uh, with the CFO's office, uh, the mayor and the council, both appointed members uh, to that commission. Uh, and last time they convened, we had a Tax Revision Commission. Uh, 
kudos to the uh, mayor and the councils over that time period afterwards, uh, because they set out which uh, uh, taxes should be adjusted. And then over a course of several budgets, we actually uh, made those changes. So I'm uh, optimistic that the Tax Revision Commission uh, will lay that out for us again. And I hope that uh, I know the executive and the council, I hope, uh, will be uh, bought into making sure that we realize uh, the tax cha changes that the Re uh, Revision Commission uh, sent forth. So I think that's important. Uh, and then uh, two uh, for the show uh, is going to be our economic strategy. So every five years, we put together an economic strategy. Councilman McDuffie uh, just mentioned it. Uh, you can find out more about it at comeback.dc.gov. Uh, many of you know uh, Sharon Carney, who's the chief of staff at Den Ped. Uh, she's doing yeoman's work to pull so many different interests together. Uh, so we've got an engagement calendar. We've got chances for people to give input uh, because we need to hear the ideas uh, from the business community about what needs to change. Uh, and you've got the mayor's commitment to making sure uh, that we bring some of those reforms in place. But uh, the tax revision commission, uh, the economic strategy, we're going to understand what we've just gone through and we're going to chart a path forward together. Thank you. Uh, I want to just encourage the uh, audience that if you do have any questions, just drop them into the chat box. Uh, we'll be opening it up to questions a little bit later, but um, please, please do drop those in. Uh, Jack uh, McDougall. Um, tell me a little bit about um, what the Board of Trade is thinking about in terms of re the regulatory environment and any other conversations or thoughts that you have about um, the business environment for the region as a whole and how that compares to the District of Columbia. So I think it's really important to uh, really look at the region as a whole and not its independent parts. You know, our annual economic output exceeds $560 billion. Uh, if we were a country, we'd have roughly the 23rd or 24th largest GDP in the world. And so how is it that we could use our regional assets much more effectively uh, to uh, spur economic growth, particularly inclusive economic growth, which is a stubborn problem in our region. And it's, it's not so much a thinking about pre-pandemic, but what do things need to look like going forward? What are the next... Uh, <clears throat> you know, opportunities that we have here in the region. And, you know, I think from a DC perspective, one thing that we'd like to see is a, a heightened commitment, a public commitment to job creation and economic growth as being priorities, you know, and we do hear that from the mayor, John, we hear it from your, your people, uh, but, you know, uh, uh, Council Member McDuffie, just also hearing from the council members that, you know, job creation is a real priority and how do we think about job creation potentially differently? You know, one of the things that struck me in the report that the DC Chamber put out this morning is the relationship between small businesses and large businesses. You know, they create the business system and both are equally important and you, you really can't prioritize one over the other. So how is it that we look at attracting businesses at all levels and how do we create jobs throughout all of those various enterprises that we're bringing in. You know, we're not gonna go back to a five day work week. I mean, I, I, I don't see any evidence of that. Uh, in fact, I was talking with a couple of firms recently that they've moved to uh, a four day work week permanently. So their employees now have a three day weekend and they're expected to be in the office two days and then they can remote work two more days. So I think we're gonna see more and more trends like that really firmly implanted. So then, the opportunity becomes attracting new companies, new investments in order to replace those types of jobs. And there's so many opportunities in front of us uh, that we can do that, but they were gonna require a very different approach. Uh, and, yep. and that looks like than what we've done in the past. Yeah, well, let's, we'll talk a little bit about that. John, would you like to? Yes, it's uh, it's gotta be work from home though. It's, it can't be, it's not a three day weekend. Uh, it is a work from home day. Uh, so. I think to Jack's point, uh, we need to understand that uh, when we talked uh, during the pandemic about what the new normal is gonna be, uh, maybe the better normal is like Jack said, that folks can uh, go into the office four days a week to work and then that one day uh, they can work from home and it's a little more flexible, it eases their commute uh, for them a bit and uh, they get to maybe do some house chores while they're doing uh, their Zooms and their, uh, and their WebExes. So I think what we got to do is make sure that we're clear that we're not saying that we need all the people to come back all the time, but we do need most of the people to come back most of the time in order for us to get back uh, to where we were. 
And so when we look at, uh, Yeshem looks at data nonstop, uh, when we look at it, we see that uh, midweek is where we see most activity. Uh, in our office, what we do is we mandate that folks come in on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Uh, and what we did at first is we took kind of that federal government approach and we said, come in whichever days, as long as you do three and two, you'll be fine. And what we realized were people were coming to the office and they weren't finding their colleagues. So that collaboration that we all need the office for uh, wasn't happening. So I think what we got to do is make sure, uh, like Jack said, that's why I wanted to jump in, that that we've got to make sure that as business leaders, uh, as executives, that we're leading by setting a clear mandate on what it means to return. That's what we need the federal government to do and also uh, folks on this uh, forum as well. I was a little surprised by your uh, comments earlier from a couple of panelists that there's that we haven't made more progress in these conversations with the federal government. It seems like I had this conversation a couple of months ago that I know WMATA was having some conversations with OPM about um, some announcements that would be coming out this fall. Um, have, have any of the com these conversations pursued uh, been made any progress at all with some federal announcement? Okay, I'll take that as a no. Okay, I, go ahead, John. Yeah, I mean, there, unless uh, something's coming down today, I haven't seen it yet. And, uh, you know, we, I think, you know, for us, and this is something maybe Yeshem could help me on too, is, you know, they've said that there's, uh, you know, a concern about the workforce and whether the workforce will flee the federal government if they make them come back to the office. Well, in district government, we haven't had that experience. Um, and I wonder, and, and this is, I'm talking about our office, we haven't had that experience, but in every industry, in every um, workforce, we see that people are shifting. So I don't know that uh, there's one indicator that's gonna say uh, you come back, but what it means for us, and then this Councilman McDuffie and Mayor Williams alluded to this earlier, it does mean that we see a hit to the bottom line uh, when our office valuations drop. Right. And the federal government has a direct impact on that, uh, whether they come back or not. And it's funny because they mention, well, we don't want to do this because we're concerned about, you know, what it means for the workforce. Well, some of that same workforce, and this is where I need Yeshem's help, some of that same workforce, their pension funds have investments in D.C. office real estate. <laughs> so at some point, you're hurting the workers on the other side. So right. I'll right. say that all of this is to say that um, you know, Mayor Bowser said throughout the pandemic, we're all in this together and we'll get through it together. Now that we're coming through it, we can't say we as office workers are going to hang back while everybody else tries to figure it out and how to make, uh, you know, do for their family. We just can't do that. That's not who we are as a city. And hopefully the federal government understands that and, and brings folks back. Yeah, Shum, do you want to follow up to that? Yeah, those are really good observations. When the pandemic started and people started working from home. Employers were thinking of returning back to work in the offices, maybe four days a week. That's what they were asking from their office workers. And the office workers were saying uh, one or two days. And what we have seen, this goes to Tony's point, because it's such a strong labor market, it's been the employers adjusting their expectations down. So we started with four, we're at three now employers. The most recent survey of worker sentiments tell us that employers are okay with two and a half and the workers are still stuck around two days. Now, to get to what uh, John is saying, something has to change. Right now, the trouble with these plans is there is absolutely no sanction. People don't show up if it rains. And there is absolutely no benefit that's so concrete that people can put their arms around that brings them back to the office. I think that will be the tricky problem to solve. There needs to be, and I, I think there is a difference between younger workers who do want to be in the office because they want to learn. They And then perhaps um, people who have been there for longer year, years, they're happy sitting in their patios and typing away. I think it will. Be, this will be the most important problem to solve. I don't believe it's going to come from the federal government. It's going to come from the private sector to really articulate the value of being in the office. Yes. And then I think the government will follow. Okay. So one of the more stunning um, 
piece of data that was in this morning's report from the chamber was that new business applications were up 20, 37% in 2021 compared to 2019. Um, and that these are high propensity applications, which are likely to result in wage paying businesses up 29% at the same time. Uh, can any any of the panelists want to respond to that? What's behind that? And what does that, that actually mean for the city's economy? It's an enormous surge in new business uh, openings. Okay. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, yes, please. No, please, yes. So this is a really interesting trend. And it's also not necessarily related to people losing their jobs and they deciding, okay, I'm doing, going to start flipping homes. It seems like there are three reasons why we're seeing an increase in the number of uh, new business starts. Uh, number one is that there have been some technological changes that have made it easier to start business, especially if you're in retail. And the uh, ability to sell things from your house or do work from your house, you know, having having an office or a place to sell things is, is very, very costly. So I think not having to pay for space has made it easier. The, an interesting challenge for the city. This, this is a really good thing. And if the district can find ways to take these online from home new businesses and turn them into brick and mortar businesses, that would be a really important thing. I think the second thing that has happened is that people have had like a moment of, okay, I've worked this job for 20 years. Here's my dream. I want to do this other thing. A lot of people have shipped sectors. And we did some research into whether this has relationship to unemployment. As I said, I don't think that's the reason. I think people are just making changes right now. And the third reason related to space is a financing requirements with these types of businesses are lower. So access to capital has been a sort of like a smaller problem. That's why you see a large number of businesses being started in communities where business starts have been relatively lower. So those are all really good things. Yeah. John? Um, so one of the initiatives that we have, uh, so today is the last year or last day of our budget year. Tomorrow, we start a new uh, FY23. Uh, for us, that's really exciting. I know that seemed very wonkish. Maybe only Mayor Williams appreciates it as much as I do. Uh, but it means that we have all of our new grants and programs uh, that the mayor proposed or the council proposed and, uh, and they funded together. So one that I'm excited about is actually uh, a new initiative to try to promote the district as a place to work uh, if you can work from anywhere. So think about it. The folks that you just said, like the folks who uh, want to start their own business, or maybe they're a federal government worker. Uh, and Yesha mentioned earlier that we're, we're an amenity rich city, right? So if you can work from anywhere uh, and you live in this area, why wouldn't you want to work from sitting in a Smithsonian? or sitting in uh, a hotel, a uh, really swanky hotel lobby. Uh, we actually have a, a company in DC called Work Chew, uh, one word, Work Chew. And what they do is they kind of do uh, uh, what WeWork does, but they do it at uh, uh, unique places like uh, a hotel lobby where you can actually uh, rent a chair to do your work for the day, right? So uh, as an example, I'm in the Wilson building right now. I'd love to have the opportunity to know that I could walk down to the new Waldorf Astoria and work from there. So I think what I'm, the reason I mentioned this is because I think what we have to do is people are starting new businesses and they're working for themselves and people are going to be working from home or out of the office uh, for some time to come, maybe most likely forever. So what we're doing is we're going to have a new tool to actually market ourselves as a place to come do that work from, uh, whether that's the individual who's working on a daily basis or those uh, 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 businesses that maybe don't come together, but bring their uh, teams together in another city to have sort of that team building experience. We want them to do it here in DC. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, Alex, can I, can I just wanted to yeah. jump in on something here too. It's, yeah. it's, really, it's been very interesting over the course of the pandemic. Um, our region as a whole ranks 11th globally for tech startups. Uh, it's pretty incredible. And between 2020 and 2021, the number of new deals financed doubled to more than just about 5 billion. That's pretty extraordinary over the course of the pandemic. And so there's some things that are going on here that I think are very, very interesting that we probably need to understand better and tap into better. 
Uh, you know, DC Startup Week is a piece of that equation, and there's some others. But, you know, we've had kind of a spotty history with incubators and uh, other types of mechanisms that continue to attract that kind of investment. And so we should be really doubling down and looking at what those opportunities are. You know, we've started to see deals uh, moving away from even New York and Silicon Valley and come our way. So how can we capitalize on that even more? as we think about the longer term growth strategy for both DC and, and the region. So just something I just wanted to put out there on top of this conversation. Well, that's that's good. Uh, Yeshim, you've also, you were quoted also in this morning's business journal that the number one thing the district has the power in its hands to do is to attract residents. It has deep implications for who buys here, who pays taxes and who sends their children to school. Now, John, John was just mentioning one sort of strategy for attracting people. Was there anything else behind your comment there? Housing. <laughs> and this administration fully understands the importance of its housing just build. I think attracting residents will be extremely important to, yeah. to um, bring life back to downtown area. Um, and building in the downtown area, building housing in the downtown area will be really important. And I know there's a lot of work going on there. Um, as John mentioned, I think the, the work of the Tax Revision Commission will be really important, but taking stock of also sort of some of the regulatory burdens, really asking the question in each and every one of those regulations, are they really serving to, you know, reduce risk, <laughs> save lives, or, or are they there but not necessarily achieving those goals and they're just burdensome? I think it will be important for the city to think through those two. Yeah. Kenyon, any thoughts on how to, um, you know, what what the district can do to attract residents back? Well, yeah, I, I want to sort of dovetail on, on the last two comments by, by John and Yasham, um, because I think, you know, it's housing, which is an important issue for residents, uh, particularly the residents we're trying to attract to the District of Columbia. Uh, but it's also, you know, how we legislate in other areas uh, of transportation. And you think about, you know, how vital Metro is to our region and to the District of Columbia, and if we're making decisions around transportation or housing, uh, decisions about our public schools, uh, decisions about public safety and, and policing, <clears throat> they're all uh, really uh, woven into the fabric of whether or not we're seen as attractive to residents, uh, to workers who wanna, who wanna come work uh, in the District of Columbia and to businesses who might locate here or, or those that are here, whether they make a decision to stay or go someplace else. And so. I say that, uh, Alex, to say that we, we can't legislate or create regulations in a vacuum as if uh, a housing decision uh, that we make doesn't have implications on, you know, whether a resident decides to come here or not, whether a decision we make on tax policy can be made in a silo uh, such that it doesn't have implications on, you know, uh, our, our robust revenues that we need to protect in order to be able to provide that strong safety net that I think everybody wants us to be able to provide. So uh, I think we, we need to think cumulatively about the impact of uh, what the work the council is doing, how we're collaborating with the executive, uh, and also what we're doing in terms of looking at our regional partners, Montgomery County Council, Prince George's County Council, what's happening in Arlington and Alexandria, uh, to, to, to think about how we are uh, competitive or otherwise not competitive with some of the things that we're doing locally. Thank you. John? Um, so uh, I also want to make sure that we're clear that uh, although a lot of what we've talked about today is about uh, this friction that we've got, you know, with the federal government and how we get folks to return, there's a lot of progress happening in D.C. Let me just tell you about my week. Uh, so on Monday, we broke ground on Barry Farm uh, with their first on-site housing uh, at New Communities. Uh, Mayor Williams, remember the New Communities Initiative, so important. Barry Farm is going to have on-site uh, development happening, leading with a 108-unit senior uh, affordable building. Uh, then on Tuesday, uh, join folks at the D.C. Chamber for a retail summer. And to your point about, uh, and Jack's point about startups, we had so many young people in a room who were excited about uh, what we're doing. And I had to get out of that retail summit and head to Skyland, uh, where we opened up Lidl. Uh, the first uh, supermarket east of the river uh, in 15 years. Uh, just yesterday, uh, uh, I was uh, at a Washington Business Journal panel talking to folks about all the great things that are happening east of the river. Uh, and then afterwards, took a hard hat tour on the campus of St. Elizabeth's 
where uh, Whitman Walker is about to get uh, the shell of the building turned over to do their internal build out uh, and bring their headquarters to Ward 8 uh, and also have some clinical space and some actual lab space uh, for research as well. Uh, and then uh, you probably read this in the Business Journal this morning, uh, McMillan. We've actually closed on McMillan. Mayor Williams uh, will remember this uh, project. Councilman McDuffie lives in the neighborhood. Uh, Councilman McDuffie, if the, if the grass grows too high there right now, it's the development team's property. You got to call them. Uh, but we're excited because think about all that progress. And that's just one week. Barry Farm, Lido at Skyland, uh, McMillan closing, uh, Saney's being about a uh, building at Saney's being turned over to Walt, uh, Whitman Walker. There's so much progress happening in D.C. And the reason I mention it is not just because part of my job is to be uh, the cheerleader for the district in terms of economic development, but also because last year uh, at Destination D.C., their marketing outlook, uh, we got a really kind of, well, I'll just say it, a sour report on the outlook for what was to come uh, from uh, uh, a division of COSAR. Uh, and they said that travelers just weren't coming back in the ways that we should. And I went up to the speaker afterwards and I said, so put yourself in my shoes. If you're deputy mayor, what do you do? And she said, actually, I stayed at the Cambria uh, down at Buzzards Point last night. I walked down to Capitol Riverfront. I saw the beautiful bridge that was there. Keep doing what you're doing. Create these attractive places and people will come because they see the work that you're doing. And so with the week that we just had, we're going to keep doing the work that we need to do to make sure that people see that our comeback is within reach. Thank you, John. Uh, 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 an amazing week. Congratulations. And uh, but I, I just want to <laughs> wanted to just turn that around just a little bit. Um, and I do want to talk a little bit about uh, development in general. And I want to talk a little bit about the health of the commercial real estate sector, which Yashim, you you had mentioned up front is part of this very balanced, you know tax base that the city has. Uh, but what do we expect is going to happen in the next few years? Uh, you know, we're seeing companies that are reticent about uh, expanding their space. We're seeing things like McMillan that will have some significant commercial real estate space in there. Um, what else uh, are we, what what are we hearing in that um, you know, the, the downstream effect a couple of years out. Uh, Mayor Williams, you want to jump in that? Yeah, I'm hoping that in the mayor, as, as it's uh, released, in the mayor's uh, vision for the city now in this economic strategy, that a big part of it is now uh, really a fresh look at the future of our downtown. So we, let's say we said, and we continue to say that residents and that tax base from investment of residents and new citizens is great for the district. I think the mayor is in a great position to now chart a course to say look we're really good the district is in a position if we do things right we have to change some things continue some things that we're doing to really be uh exemplar of corporate headquarters in a blue city now what do i mean by that there are a lot of companies that we're never going to get because they're just looking for lowest cost lowest price no income tax or going to taxes you're not, we're not going to get those companies, but there are a lot of companies that are willing to be in a New York, willing to be in a Boston, willing to be in a Washington, D.C., as long as things are within certain parameters, you know, companies of certain, you know, uh, cultures or, 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 you know, with certain strategic outlooks, or they do certain things, where being in Washington, D.C. would be great for that company. We have a real opportunity to bring those headquarters to D.C. and really set a global example. And I think the mayor and the council are in an excellent position now to do that. Uh, John, council member, uh, do you think we'll we'll um we'll be seeing that from the from the administration? I, I hope so. I'll let I'll let John speak to it, but I I, I really hope so. I think attracting those types of uh, companies is going to be absolutely uh, essential uh, to the future of the District of Columbia and and really improving on the progress that we've seen uh, over the years. But I think. Attracting those companies is, is one aspect of it. Attracting the people who are going to work there to live in a district is another aspect of it, which brings us back to the conversation about uh, housing affordability and why we need to continue to build quality affordable housing across the District of Columbia. So the goals that the mayor have laid out 
uh, both in terms of building units and affordable units, but also where they're being built across the District of Columbia, west of Rockley Park, is essential. I mean, it means strong schools. It means making sure that we have a strong uh, transportation system and a strong metro system. It means that uh, our, our public safety has continued to be robust so that people feel safe. Uh, it means we have to protect the culturally rich activities that are happening across the District of Columbia with investments in uh, those communities that we've been doing uh, throughout the course of the pandemic, making sure that continues into the future. So uh, I really think we can uh, attract those types of companies, but we have to make it intentional in our efforts to reach out and say the District of Columbia is open for business and we're welcoming folks uh, into uh, the District of Columbia. And here's the, the, the regulatory environment within which you have to work. Uh, and it's just as competitive as others around our region. Yeah. Uh, John, uh, let me ask you my one of my favorite questions. What's the status of uh, office to residential conversions and the regulatory burdens that businesses face to do that? Yeah, so we actually will uh, come out with a, uh, a new tax incentive uh, to try to incent uh, office to residential conversions. Uh, our partners at uh, Department of Housing and Community Development will put those out uh, this fall. Um, and uh, you don't have to go look around all of DC.gov, just go to obviouslydc.com. That's where we list all of these different programs that I'll talk about today, uh, obviouslydc.com. But I think what Councilman McDuffie has said is, is really important, so we should hinge on that. It used to be that when a CEO moved their company, they moved it within 10 miles of where they live, right? Right. Now is there's a hunt for talent uh, that is so uh, competitive that the CEOs and the companies know that they have to move to where the talent is. So we have an innate advantage because we are one of the most highly educated uh, regions in the country, uh, if not the highest uh, educated. And so we gotta make sure that we keep promoting that. The other thing I see is there's some trends that are changing uh, in what companies look for. It used to be the lowest value. Where can you go that the talent is there, but you uh, have the lowest value or We've seen companies that tried to move from New York City to Nashville and the employees didn't follow and the talent wasn't available, right? And so what we see is a friction when we try to just move to a low cost city. So what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that we highlight the talent that we have, but also our DC values are a part of what companies are looking for. When you talk about DEI and uh, ESG, those are uh, now at the forefront of what companies look for when they're doing uh, relocation uh, to a different uh, a different market. Uh, so we've got to make sure that we promote that as well. And then one of the things I'll say is, the, uh, when you think about downtown, uh, we call it our central business district. Uh, and I'll give another uh, uh, shout out to Sharon Carney. He told me that recently we have to stop thinking of it as our central business district uh, and just thinking of it as our central district. Uh, and we can easily change that in our vernacular but we really have to do three things. We've got to change the space. So those office to residential conversions, we've got to uh, fill the space and we're going to do that with programs like uh, COSM or the Vitality Fund. Again, obviously DC.com uh, to try to really bring people back into those office spaces. Uh, and then we're going to bring back the people. Uh, you see what we did with uh, something in the water where we actually have festivals and activations downtown. We've got to do more of that. So if we change the space, if we fill the space and we bring the people, that's how we bring back downtown. And then also one final thing, the mix of use in downtown is off kilter for the way that people live now. Uh, when you look at the neighborhoods that are thriving, like Capitol Riverfront or Union Market, they have a better balance of commercial, residential. And so what we need to do is we need to really push forward on making sure that we get more residential uh, into the central district. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got a, uh, I want to just make sure that uh, we leave some time for some questions from the audience. So I want to encourage them to uh, drop those in the chat. I do want to ask a question just a little bit on our diversity initiatives. Um, the pandemic uh, hit uh, our less economically advantaged portions of our community disproportionately hard. Uh, what else can the city be doing to ensure the recovery and the ups and downs of the next months and years benefit these communities. Uh, Council member, do you want to tackle that? Well, I think um, we, we've never actually lost sight of it. In fact, in the District of Columbia, we've been doing a lot of work around racial equity, social justice, and economic 
uh, opportunity and inclusion. Uh, before it started dominating the headlines with the tragic killing of George Floyd, we were already working uh, to do these types of things. Uh, the pandemic actually highlighted, uh, obviously, the need to do more. Uh, but here in the district, when we did the uh, the pandemic first struck, we had, uh, I, I worked with the mayor and John and, and folks in the hospitality, tourism, leisure, restaurant industries, those industries that were uh, in large part responsible for our economic uh, resurgence pre-pandemic. We worked with them to, uh, to and I offered a $100 million business grants program uh, to provide resources to them. And we actually had a carve out for businesses in wards five, seven, and eight uh, to make sure that they got their fair share. Uh, we are uh, conscious of, you know, here in the District of Columbia, how important it is that uh, our recovery be equitable. Uh, that means that those businesses in wards five, seven, and eight are, uh, are able to access and are aware of all the myriad of programs that we put in place to try to make sure that they uh, can continue to move and see the progress that we'd like to see the district continue to engage in. And what it means is a uh, commercial property acquisition fund. Uh, that allowing people who rent their businesses in the District of Columbia to be able to uh, tap into uh, grants to acquire their commercial property. It means a, a access to capital fund that we established during the uh, pandemic that is uh, giving uh, some businesses some seed money to be able to start up or grow uh, their businesses. Uh, it means that we're uh, mindful of our workforce and getting them training. We worked uh, with the mayor uh, and the folks at the Federal City Council uh, to put money in the U University of District of Columbia for a training program in partnership with Amazon Web Services to make sure that UDC can teach students and have the professors have the resources that they need to engage in that training so that our students, our residents can compete for those cloud-based uh, jobs that exist in our market uh, through Amazon and other companies for that matter. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Williams, I know you've done a lot of deep thinking on this topic. Um, what, what's, uh, what, what is your... Uh... What what is what would your approach be? What what's some recommendations that you have about um, making sure that we include all of our disadvantages communities in this recovery? Anything else that the city can do? I think that we've learned a lot about the uh, economic expansion uh, over the last twenty years, and I think we know now how to do economic uh, revitalization, neighborhood building, new communities, and I would anticipate that Berry Farms would be an example of this. We know how to do this without displacement. We know how to do it. We know how to do it right. We know how to now involve other services, not just housing, but schools, public safety, uh, other economic initiatives in uh, neighborhood building. I think that's key. I'm a big believer in before we do new things, let's do the old things right. And I would also add, uh, public safety is really important to our communities, uh, particularly east of the river. Uh, Yes, I think, you know, funding the police adequately, looking at public safety, you know, you can't jump the turnstiles, you know, if, if you've committed certain crimes, you got to be held accountable. I'm a big believer in that. I think we need more sense of urgency in the criminal justice spectrum yeah. from everybody's perspective. So, so uh, John, uh, you and I were in Ward 8 last night, and there was a lot of anxiety that we heard about displacement. Uh, what are uh, what are some of the things that the city is doing to sort of protect uh, some of the historic communities in Anacostia and Congress Heights? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, and this is why it's so important. Uh, Councilman McDuffie has not just been a voice and a vote, but a leader on making sure that the District of Columbia government uh, helps communities overcome not just decades, but centuries of government policy that discriminated against uh, Black residents and Black Americans. And so we've got to be very de uh, deliberate about our policies uh, to make sure that we uh, have uh, greater uh, ownership for Black businesses, like Councilman McDuffie said, of the buildings that they actually operate in, because that gives them more uh, authority over uh, the direction of their business. That we also uh, increase uh, home ownership uh, for Black individuals and Black families. Uh, on Monday, the mayor is going to receive recommendations from her Black Homeownership Strike Force uh, about how we do that. But also, because our budget year starts tomorrow, uh, our Home Purchase Assistance Program is going to go from $80,000 of down payment assistance to $202,000 of down payment assistance. And three quarters of the users of that program historically have been Black. 
So we are creating uh, black homeowners by uh, making sure we send them into the market even more empowered uh, with home buyer assistance uh, yeah. down payment, make sure we do it. So everything that we do, we've got to make sure that we're, uh, and also uh, one other area too, in government contracting, uh, Councilmember McDuffie uh, sanctioned uh, a disparity study that will soon uh, release that uh, really challenged the district government to see what opportunities there were for uh, people of color when it comes to government contracting. So in all those ways, we've got to be very deliberate about uh, what we've experienced in the past decades and centuries and have delivered policies that help people overcome uh, that lack of access to capital because of it. Great. Thank uh, you. Alex, 15 more seconds really quickly. The, I want to give Chairman Minnison a shout out too. Uh, we passed the Racial Equity Achieves Results Act and I work really closely with him and Brandon Todd when he was on the council. It means that the government must do its work both on the executive side and the council side through a lens of racial equity. And I think that's extraordinarily important. We created a council office of racial Thank equity, you. as well as one on the executive side. Good. Thank you. Um, so uh, I've got one last question that we're going to do a rapid round for all of our panelists. And, um, you know, as the as our panelists coming to an end, we're going to be sitting back here a year from now. We're going to be having the same panel discussion. Hopefully I'll be invited back to moderate. Um, and you're going to look back on this year and you're going to say, the following one thing has happened in this past year, in 2022, 2023. What is that thing? What What are you going to look back on with satisfaction? And that's going to give us hope. I'm going to turn to you first, Yashim. Did you have to? Okay. That's a really difficult question. I think... Um, Professionally, from my end, I would like to go back and say, I better understand the reasons behind which businesses make certain types of decisions. That's our professional goal at the Policy Center, really understand how COVID changed things and what advantages it creates for the district and the region. Okay. And hopefully I will report back with some numbers. Good. Uh, Jack, again, you're looking back from October 1st, 2023. And you're saying that this this is what we're what we're content with the uh, the changes that have happened. Now that Chairman Powell has walked away from a soft landing, um, I'd like to be in a position where we are recovering rapidly from whatever economic turmoil we're facing. Thank you, Mayor Williams. So um, there are many things I would incorporate. You know, I would certainly endorse what uh, Jack and uh, Yeshim was saying, but I would I would take. Uh, the one metric that we talked about earlier that so many businesses started in the district, which shows you the resilience of a business. If you just give business any opportunity like water, it's gonna fill that vacuum. I would hope that a year from now, we've, been, we've set a national model of sustaining a record number of those businesses and allowing those plants to grow. Bravo. Council member, besides being elected, what else would you like to? Yeah. I'd like to be able to look back and say that uh, you know, residents, workers, and businesses have all uh, been looking at the District of Columbia as a place of opportunity, uh, somewhere where they want to locate uh, because residents are going to get you know, strong schools, they're going to get housing that they can afford, they're going to have a transportation system they can use, and a robust safety net. I think we're going to look at businesses who say, uh, we can come here and hire from the population because they're well-trained. Uh, we, they got incomes that they can pay for our goods and services, and the, and the regulatory environment is one that we can work in. Uh, and I think workers are going to want to be here because they see all the opportunities to be able to work and live and raise a family. So that's what I like to be able to see, Alex. Deputy Mayor. Uh, so some of my colleagues in Demped are watching uh, this panel. So uh, this is where I have a meeting within a meeting uh, where I'll say that our challenge is going to be starting tomorrow. Uh, we'll have $15 million in the Vitality Fund. Uh, which is meant to attract businesses back to D.C. Uh, so it's a challenge not just for DEMPET, but for the D.C. Chamber and all the leaders on this call that we actually uh, work to exhaust that fund before we meet again next year, because that'll mean that we've made some major attraction or retention uh, in our central business district. So that's, uh, Alex, I know you're going to hold me to it. Uh, and I know my team is nervously watching, but hopefully Angela and Dr. Rudd are watching too and are accepting the challenge to make sure we exhaust the vitality fund. Well, well I want to thank our panelists for a uh, you know, uh, for your patience with my questions and your uh, 
and your terrific answers. And thank you to the DC Chamber for your leadership, uh, for certainly inviting me, but also for your leadership and helping with the recovery. Uh, Angela, thank you very much.